we'll go ahead and get started. All right, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Carr and I am coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, as well as editor of the Skimron Marine Ecosystems and Management, both uh, services of Octo. Um, and with me here today, I have Nick Weiner, uh, who is also Oh, uh, who's helping to co-host and who's also with Octo. Um, we're, we're very pleased everyone can be here today uh, for Emma McKinley's webinar. Emma um, is a research fellow at Cardiff University in Wales in the UK. Her work explores the relationships between society and the ocean and focuses on concepts around ocean literacy, marine citizenship, and public perceptions and attitudes towards marine and coastal systems. Her most recent projects have explored the relationship between ocean literacy and behavior change and coastal community adaptation to climate change in Ireland and Wales. Uh, she is also the founder and chair of the Marine Social Science Network, which she's gonna be speaking about today. And we're very glad she could be here with us. Um, before we, I turn this over to Emma, I wanted to let everyone know how to ask questions. Um, with, with Zoom, you can uh, type questions into the question panel, or you can type them into the chat. With the chat, you have the options of making um, comments and questions visible just to the panelists or to everyone in the audience. Um, please, we just ask if you are gonna make everything visible to the entire audience, please keep it on the topic, uh, but we welcome your comments and thoughts there too. And I believe you'll be asked for comments as well. Emma, thank you so much for being here with us. I'll, I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you very much for that um, introduction. It's always strange hearing your, yourself being introduced. So thank you so much for inviting me to speak this afternoon for me. Um, I am going to talk to you about the importance of connecting people in the ocean and the role of marine social sciences. If anyone was expecting me to talk about bottom trawling or climate change and Brexit, that was a previous talk. I'm sorry if I disappoint you, um, but I'm gonna talk to you about um, the, the kind of the context and the background for marine social sciences and as Sarah said introduce you to the marine social science network um, as well and think about the lessons that we've learned as we've established and kind of grown the network over the last couple of years. I'm just going to get my slides to move. Oh hang on. Technical issue. There we go. Hopefully they're going to work out. Um, so as I said I'm going to talk to you about the, the kind of the, the need for marine social sciences, why it's so important and kind of recognizing the groundswell I think that we're really seeing around integrating social and natural sciences, talk about the, the, the network and then um, conclude and hopefully have lots of time for discussion and questions at the end. Um, but for a little bit of interaction while I'm speaking, I'd really love to hear your thoughts or the, the one word or idea or image that you think of or that you feel when you hear the word ocean. And if you could pop those in the chat box as I'm talking, it doesn't matter when that happens through the presentation, it'd be really great to see those responses um, as, as I'm giving my talk and at the end, to just reflect on the different things that come out. So what do you think of or feel when you hear the word ocean? Thanks. Okay, so to give you a bit of overview about myself, I thought that's where I'd start really. Um, I have always been someone who needed and wanted and had to be by the sea. And those photos are of me at various stages of my life. And I'm sure my various siblings would be thrilled to know they're being broadcast on YouTube right now. Um, but just the, the being by the ocean, despite growing up in an inland community, has always been something that's really important. I actually started school in Saudi Arabia, so in a desert. Um, and despite that, despite perhaps not having that immediate connection to ocean and coastal spaces, it's definitely something that if you ask my mum, what was Emma going to do? It was always going to be going down the marine biology route, despite the fact that I may not have always known that that's what it was called. And that's what I did. So I started off and um, being inspired by a visit to SeaWorld when I was five. And of course, there's been a huge shift in the conversation around SeaWorld over the last 20, 30 years or so, um, giving away my age a little bit here. But, you know, that, that was really the inspiration for my introduction to marine and, and ocean worlds and the, that kind of awe and inspiration. And I think we need to kind of recognise how many of us maybe were inspired by that. Um, and and that, that, as I said, that shift in conversation. And, and I did go on to do that, that marine biology. So I started off very much within the world of natural sciences, did a, a degree, um, but finished a thesis looking at the um, predatory success of, um, no, sorry, I need to really think about this, the habitat complexity on predatory success um, for rock gobies in Scottish sea lochs and then did a stable isotope project. So very natural sciences, very lab-based, very much in the marine biology world. 
But then I worked on a conservation project in Thailand and had a very interesting conversation with a couple who asked me why we couldn't just tell people to stop fishing. And this was a couple of years after the tsunami had hit in, in um, that area of the world. And it really struck me how there was this kind of blind spot to those conversations and the fact that, well, those people were feeding their children. It's not about, not just about protecting the environment, which of course is really important. It's also about recognizing the social complexity, the culture and heritage aspects, the people that are inherent within these marine and coastal systems. And that conversation completely changed my career and the trajectory of my research. And for the last 15 years or so, I've been very firmly positioned within the world of marine social sciences. And I think one of the really key things is that we don't have to look very far anywhere in the world, even if we live kind of far further away from the coast and others, to really see the role of marine and coastal systems, the role of the ocean um, in our everyday lives, for those of us that are kind of aware and, and can see that. The ocean has obviously acted as a connector across time and space and um, bringing together communities and society for generations. So it's acted as a connector for trade and transport for traditional and historical industries that you'd expect to see like fishing and um, shipping and, and as I said, trade, trade routes. But that, um, that relationship and those industries have obviously evolved over time. We saw the advent of the cruise industry that kind of made the world a much smaller place, allowed people to get on the water um, in a very different way. The recognition of our marine and coastal spaces, our blue spaces, as being crucial for health and well-being through conversations around Victorian seaside spaces and um, them being important, the, the seaside spa resorts. Um, that you found in the UK, for example. So that, that relationship um, between people and the sea and the ocean coast has really continued to change. It's a very dynamic um, thing and it, it changes through, through time. It, it changes and, um, and is influenced by a range of different factors. What struck me through my research and it's one of the things that we've seen more recently is that the world has become quite disconnected in places between um, society in the ocean. So although that's not the case everywhere, on the whole there's been a growing amount of research over the last maybe 20 years or so that's really shown this kind of lack of awareness or lack of recognition um, of the everyday role that society that the ocean plays um, in society's life. And this quote from Rose George's book Deep Sea and Far and Going for me really captures that um, and kind of describes ports and the shipping industries the fact that there's no ordinary citizens, so no everyday people, to witness the inner workings of an industry that is perhaps one of the more fundamental to our daily existence and to the globalization and connection that we see across the world. And I think that's very true. You know, most people sitting at home, working at home, as a lot of us have been for the last year, maybe don't think about where their laptops came from, where their desks, their kitchen tables, their breakfast bars, wherever we're working where those bits of furniture have come from, what kind of import and export might have happened across the ocean to bring those items to their, to their world. They don't think about the industry or the people that are kind of fundamental to, to that part of their lives. And I think we've really seen that across lots of areas of marine and coastal spaces. Well, of course, we know, particularly those of us that have been working in marine um, conservation, marine um, natural resource management for years, we know that the impacts of society on our global oceans are widespread. And um, this image is quite old now. It was um, one from a, a, one of um, Holprin's papers in 2008, which shows um, an illustration of the, the impacts of human activities and not just not any kind of one activity singled out. It's a kind of an accumulation of the impact of anthropogenic activities across our global ocean. And obviously the darker red or, or the warmer the color, the more intense the impact. So you can see darker reds around Northern Europe, around East Asia, and um, bits around North America, places where you'd expect to see high levels of activity. But I guess what the more, more important message is, is that there's very little that's a pale color. There's very little of that cooler blue. And what it really shows is that that vast spread of our impacts on our global ocean coasts and seas. And while it's really important, again, to recognise those impacts and to recognise the challenges that that disconnect and that, that those human uses have had on our marine and coastal spaces, what's also really important and perhaps 
um, something that's maybe signaled a bit of a change in that conversation more recently is there's uh, this reframing of society as not just being part of the challenge, but as part of the solution. So creating more recognition of the link between ocean health, ocean ecology, ecological health and human health, thinking about how those aspects of well-being and connectivity feed into our policy development and bringing society along with us in those conversations. And I think marine social sciences really lends us, lends us a number of tools through which we can explore that kind of complexity and, and those multifaceted relationships that we need to further improve um, effective and sustainable management of our ocean and coastal spaces, both now and in the future. So in terms of thinking about connecting people to the ocean, one of the, the kind of key drivers of that, that discourse, I think, over the last 15, 20 years or so has been this shift in thinking about how we value these, uh, value the environment more generally, but of course, for, for the purposes of today's talk, value ocean and coastal resources. And, and that started with conversations around the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment in the early 2000s, which started to try to give us a, a feeling of the state of affairs. Where were we at? What, what, does our, um, what do our different ecosystems look like? What, what's their condition? We moved on to the TEAB assessment, so the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity assessment, which began to put an economic value um, on these resources and helped decision makers to think about what was important to protect or to manage or to invest in in certain ways, in certain cases. And of course, building on the TEAB um, reports and the, the stuff that have been done by the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, we've had national approaches to that as well. So where I'm based in the UK, we've had two um, UK national ecosystem assessments, one in 2011 and one in 2014. And again, that focus was on the economic valuation and thinking about the that financial value. So quite a, a, a single lens kind of perspective on, on that and um, the value of our ocean and coastal spaces. But more recently, we've really seen this shift in conversation and thinking about the relationship between people and those environments as being much more multidimensional. The need to think about well-being and intrinsic values and social and cultural values that are really imperative to our understanding of the relationship between society and the sea. So it's moving away from perhaps this very linear kind of ecosystem services conversation, natural capital conversation, thinking about the benefits running from the marine ecosystem to the services to the, the goods and benefits that we as society kind of derive from our ocean to something that's a bit more nuanced and, and probably a little bit more complicated as well so it's not this kind of linear framework which is really helpful I think probably for, for decision makers but actually when we're trying to understand people ocean and, and their, their place or their sense of place it's much more complicated than that and we know that the reality is that the relationships between society and sea take many different forms. We have a range of different industries, a range of different users, a range of different audiences that we need to take account of. And again, we get this really much more complicated network of lines and, and kind of connect connections between what maybe we've traditionally talked about as ecosystem services, so the goods and benefits that people might get from the ocean and the different kind of aspects of well-being and um, societal cohesion, um, whatever those benefits might be from the ocean. So I think fundamentally what I always try and stress is that we have to take account of these various different um, communities, users, uh, groups um, that are engaging with our ocean and coastal spaces. Everybody on this call right now, and there's quite a lot of you, um, everybody uh, in these images, they'll all have a different connection to marine and coastal environments to any environment but to marine and coastal environments because of their their gender their experiences their um cultural connections their education their the holidays they went on as children how close they lived to the, the coast to the ocean what kind of engagement they had with the ocean the tv they watched so many factors will influence and drive not only their own value of the ocean, but perhaps how they connect with it and the behaviors that they engage with as well. So it's really important that we're aware of this kind of diversity and that we don't think about people when we talk about connecting people to the ocean. We don't kind of think of them as one group. We're a very mixed, very kind of muddled up group of different audiences, different communities, and we absolutely have to take account of that. 
one of the things that I think is also really important, kind of drawing on my own story, is that we don't forget to think about those people that are maybe not traditionally considered coastal communities. So particularly somewhere like the UK, where none of us are that far away from um, our, our coast, but everywhere is connected to a river, to a catchment, everywhere eventually drains into the ocean. And so really making sure we think about us all as this kind of maritime connected to the ocean group of people is really important. And that's why I include the, the image of the aquarium um, because the ocean inspires no matter where, where we are. Um, and so I think we need to kind of really consider and, and take account of those really diverse groups when we're considering connecting people to the ocean. From a policy landscape perspective, we're at a really excellent time for having these conversations. So January saw the launch of the UN Ocean Decade, which of course sets out a range of aspirations for the next 10 years for ocean science. One of them being to better integrate natural and social science disciplines. And for me, I think it's really important we also think about arts and humanities work within that as well. That we take out of different knowledges, different value types, and we really start thinking about this complex web of connections between society and the ocean. And so for me, it's really encouraging to see such a um, globally recognized document being kind of having these conversations, including these words, because it's something we've been trying to kind of push the, the discourse on for, for a number of years. So they're calling for this transformational relationship between society and the ocean and, and highlighting opportunities for things like increasing ocean literacy and um, to really start nurturing and developing improved um, and enhanced connection and, and changing in, in that feeling of stewardship and, and behaviour change for ocean and coastal spaces. Closer to home for me here in the UK, we, we're seeing similar um, messages being mirrored in our own national and, and devolved administration policies. So this quote, on the bottom of the slide is from the um, 25 year environment plan for England. Um, and again, we're seeing that, that need to recognize the full value of the marine environment. So it's great to see that shift away from purely an economic focus, which again is very important. We do of course need to think about those much more diverse values and recognize the importance of those different connections to ocean and coastal spaces, uses and, and kind of activities to make sure we're really delivering and developing the most effective ocean policy and governance processes that we possibly can. And if we move away from the research landscape, we're seeing, sorry, from the policy landscape, we're seeing this kind of message mirrored, not only from a, within the public. So we saw um, the response to Blue Planet 2 a few years ago, really driving forward, really significant momentum on the marine plastic agenda, um, the school strikes for climate, has been really important over the last couple of years and really kind of brought us into thinking about the, the youth voice in these conversations and, and what that means for inclusivity and equality in the, in the discourse we have around marine and coastal spaces. And also, of course, more recently, um, regardless of your thoughts on sea spiracy and um, the fact that people are talking about ocean issues so much more than they were five years ago, I think is a really important thing and we need to harness that momentum to continue moving forward and keep those conversations going. It's a real opportunity for us to engage with public voices and make sure we're bringing those, those people into our conversations. From a research perspective, that little tweet in the middle of that slide really is, is from a, a researcher here in the UK that, that talks about the need to think about diverse values and interdisciplinarity. And I've just come from a meeting today where we were really thinking about how we can encourage interdisciplinarity across marine um, and ocean science um, in the UK. And I think it's been fantastic to see that conversation moving forward so much in the last few years as well. So while of course there are challenges, I am very much an optimist and I, I think that we are moving hopefully from this space of kind of an ego type perspective to really positioning people as in part of the whole system and thinking in a much more integrated and holistic way. We might not be there yet, but we're having those conversations about integration and inclusivity, which is fantastic to see. So when I talk about marine social sciences, I mean a very broad brush of, of things. Um, when we talk about it from the Marine Social Science Network perspective, which I'll come on to later, we want to be as inclusive as possible within the marine social science disciplines. So we talk about the disciplines that you'd expect to see in there, sociology, economics, psychology, human geography, but we also include people working in blue growth, in governance, planning, arts, culture and heritage, humanities, resilience, all of those um, factors that really 
sum up or explain in some way the relationship between society and the sea. We're pretty open. So if you're interested, come and, come and join the conversation. We, we want to hear from you. We want to be as open and inclusive as possible and move away from kind of siloed way of work, ways of working. Of course, there are benefits to, to working within your discipline, within your sector. But we really kind of felt like when we were setting up the network, that there's a real opportunity for us to learn from each other. And marine social sciences give us a number of different lenses and tools for us to explore and, and understand the relationship between people and the ocean. So we're not communicators, we're not the kind of the tagline at the end of a project to be the engagers um, or to do the public engagement work. We are problem solvers, we are researchers in our own right and have investigative queries that we want to understand um, to, under, to kind of unpick that relationship. So these different methodologies that allow us to really understand and um, investigate and interrogate the, that complexity that I've talked about a few times already. And I guess it's just highlighting the opportunities as well that we have to, to really think about how we can connect people to the ocean, what methodologies are there available to us. So we know that we are very much on our blue planet. The ocean is everywhere. I've mentioned already that it connects us all. So what can we use? What technologies can we use? What processes? And we're really seeing kind of a range of different approaches. So things like Google Earth allowing us to discover the ocean through its kind of sea, its ocean um, platform. I've already mentioned Blue Planet, but also things like STEM engagement and outreach and public activities that allow us to get our messages out there. And I think there's definitely an increasing responsibility and an increasing call for researchers to move away from just working within um, academic publications and doing things like this, doing webinars, doing public outreach activities that we could do in person a few kind of 18 months ago, maybe hopefully we'll be able to do it again at some point soon. Um, but really think of different tools and the different opportunities that are available to us to bring our messages, to bring our science to these different audiences that we're trying to engage with. We're seeing some fantastic examples of using art to connect people to the heritage of maritime communities, of coastal communities. This is an example of an exhibition that was being run in um, Halifax and Nova Scotia. Um, but think about how we can kind of tap into those different values. So the Marine Collaboration Project is a UK-based project working with um, nine different organizations, taking a really values-based approach to understanding um, ocean and coastal relationships. And thinking about that kind of an inextricable connection between people and the ocean and, and, and using a values-based framework to help us understand how best to communicate some quite complex issues and challenges and, and perhaps um, topics that, that might kind of be harder for people to understand if they're not working in the kind of the science world. So we're thinking about tapping into people's values and, and using that as a way of communicating and engaging and connecting them with ocean and coastal spaces. If we take um, public perceptions research as one facet of marine social sciences, um, we can see that there's been a real exponential increase in, in this work over the last kind of 15, 20 years or so. And um, this is an excerpt of some work that I'm, I'm, I'm currently working on with a colleague, Rebecca, um, Rebecca Jefferson from um, Human Nature. She has been leading this work for a couple of years. And what we were trying to understand was really what's the state of play for public perceptions research from the marine environment. And while it's just a snapshot of one aspect of marine social sciences, I think that trend is being mirrored across um, the disciplines across the marine social science community, which is absolutely fa um, fantastic to see and really encouraging and inspiring for us to move forward and continue to collaborate with each other um, and, and across ocean sciences more generally. We're seeing people working on a range of different topics. So thinking about general attitudes towards marine and coastal spaces, thinking about recreational values of marine and coastal environments, what motivates people to kind of undertake certain behaviors, um, attitudes towards climate change, what the barriers might be for behaviours, um, the renewable energy, and I'm sure that's going to be more of the conversation coming, moving forward, ocean acidification, well-being, and, and we're really seeing a real push for that kind of conversation, particularly here in Wales, where we have a, a Wellbeing and Future Generations Act that kind of positions well-being at the centre of many of our conversations. Um, and really just showing that, you know, our, our ocean and coastal spaces are essentially they are very quite human spaces, as well as kind of thinking about the the, um, the flora and fauna 
within them. And we need to really understand and better understand those relationships. Um, and crucially, encourage, um, increasingly understanding the emotional connection that people have with our, our marine and coastal environment. So this report was um, commissioned in the last couple of years by the European Mission Board for Healthy Ocean coast seas and inland waters it's a bit of a mouthful to think about the emotional disconnect or connection that people may or may not have with Europe's um, marine and coastal spaces and other water bodies as well um, and DEFRA in the UK have and um, so our Department for Environment Food and Rural Affairs have recently been really interested in pushing forward the ocean literacy agenda here and have commissioned work to kind of understand what ocean literacy means in the UK and, and are undertaking um, a, a study on that and um, what well, I think it's actually just finished um, recently so we're seeing that work happen here but also further field I know Canada's just released their um, ocean literacy strategy as well so it's great to see this kind of upward shift and this growth in, in that literature base and that engagement but there are gaps so these trends are come from the public perceptions work that Rebecca's been leading on but in studies that I've done and um, looking at marine social sciences more generally we're definitely seeing that so there are geographical variations where we definitely need to think about gaps in capacity but also research activity in the global south and there's a lot of focus in north and um, northwest europe north america australia and asia and sorry australia and new zealand and um, with a need to think about the geographical gaps in other places and um, we're also still sort of using the traditional methodologies of questionnaires and interviews more than some of those more creative um, approaches that we could to really understand those complexities. Um, so there are opportunities for us to diversify our own toolkits and think about the different methods that we're using. And we tend to focus, or there's, there's historically been a lot of focus on some of the more attractive topics and the things that are quite kind of um, timely or current, I suppose. So things like um, coral reefs, marine protected areas, beaches, general perceptions towards marine environments but less around things like wetlands and seagrasses and, and mangroves, algae, things that we know are fundamental to healthy ocean systems, but are not being researched from a, from a people perspective. So there are gaps in terms of our thematic knowledge. And um, so lots of work still to do, but we're doing lots already. And I, I always want to, as I said, always an optimist. So there are lots of projects that are already kind of trying to unpick and give us tools to understand and work with people and, and kind of understand those relationships. So these are just a handful of some of the projects that I'm aware of in the UK, in Europe, but also further afield. There are things like um, the Coral Communities Project that use arts-based approaches, really creative approaches to work with communities um, in Mauritius and Zanzibar to think about quite complex issues around resilience and sustainability around the coral reefs in those areas. The Pericles project, which is a, a European funded project talking about cultural heritage and um, Cherish is another um, in, uh, European funded project between Ireland and Wales, looking at the impacts of climate change on heritage in the marine environment. And then you have um, initiatives like the We Are Ocean Collective, who are really trying to push forward that understanding of values of connection and the positioning the ocean as that as being part of the heart of society there's so many fantastic projects and so much i guess ocean optimism to be aware of and to think about and if anybody wants any of the links to any of these projects or initiatives please let me know i can put you in touch with probably most of the people linked to these projects or send you send you links so just to bring us back to this kind of this um policy governance landscape and what it means for us moving forward um, so bringing you back to that quote that I showed at the beginning, we're in a space, a place of, in, in time where we're being called upon to deliver a transformational relationship between society and the ocean. That is essentially a call to arms from the UN Ocean Decade for us to make it meaningful, for us to make it effective over the next 10 years, and not just to be a decade that's kind of slipped through our fingers. So we've got a real opportunity to make change um, in the next 10 years. There's been a real shift in the blue economy conversation over the last 10, 15 years or so, where it's moved away again from being very focused on maritime industries and economic growth to perhaps being one that's more inclusive, more equitable, more just. Um, and thinking about this definition, particularly from the Commonwealth um, Blue Charter, that kind of positions it as it being an opportunity to think about better stewardship of our ocean 
And I think that shift in the discourse is something that's really encouraging and an opportunity again for us, to, for us to bring people, ocean and place together into the conversations that we're having. And of course, it would be remiss of me not to mention the, the very challenging times that we've seen in the last year or so with the COVID-19 pandemic and, and the impact of that's had, that, that has obviously had on our coastal communities. The ocean economy, like many other vulnerable economies, has obviously been affected in lots of different ways, far too um, many for me to talk about in today's session, but I know that that's been covered, I'm sure will be covered by other speakers. But perhaps there's an opportunity for us to think about this move towards a blue recovery in such a way that it's not just about the economic recovery, it's about the how we can support an ecological recovery, how we can talk about reconnecting people to their ocean and coastal environments where that's needed. And again, of course, I'm not saying it's needed everywhere, but where it is needed, where it's appropriate and really stimulating kind of longer term growth, so societal resilience and cohesion, and um, those multiple benefits for society and the environment. So I think hopefully there's an opportunity and we need to make the most of those um, moving forward. And, and there's lots of ways that we can do that. So I've mentioned ocean literacy a couple of times and um, there's a real push for that agenda through the UN Ocean Decade. And that's this top left, I think, as I'm looking at the one with the, the red arrows um, comes from a paper uh, by Brennan et al from 2019. And I guess it's just to kind of highlight that again, the, the complexity of ocean literacy, but there is an opportunity. So ocean literacy can be um, very simply defined as an awareness of the ocean's um, influence on you and your influence on the ocean. And that conversation has been moving forward over the last couple of years to really think about the emotional connections, what that means in terms of people's behaviours, how they can get engaged with ocean issues, the transparency of governance, the, the societal challenges that can be addressed through enhancing ocean literacy across a range of different scales. So not just our, our kind of our communities, but also our institutions. How can we look to the ocean more? Um, and that conversation around ocean literacy has been kind of coupled with a growing discussion around the ideas of marine citizenship, which again bring in this idea of active engagement and awareness of your rights and your responsibilities towards marine and coastal spaces in such a way that is, of course, equitable and socially just. Um, and we're seeing also scholars working on ideas around the blue economy, as I mentioned earlier. So thinking about how we can put people into those conversations and Tavis Potts um, from the University of Aberdeen developed a model, um, which is this model in the centre with the blue circle in the middle, um, to think about um, putting social values and behaviours, traditional um, ecological knowledge, social innovation, social capital, to make that a, a really key core component of the blue economy model. Um, and that is further built upon by recent work by Nathan Bennett, who set out a number of priorities for kind of developing um, a sustainable governance model to move the blue economy forward. And again, that put people and, and social, um, uh, sustainability and, and inclusivity and, equi and, and equity right at the center of those conversations. So there are opportunities, I think, to, to really move this transformational relationship forward. And there's lots of things that we can do, like understanding the health and safety of our workers and our communities, linking between sustainable blue economy and ocean health and the well-being of communities, taking account of diverse values. And um, marine social sciences can really support a number of these different avenues. Um, I'm not going to try and go into all of these boxes because I know I'm running out of time. But if anybody has any interest in talking about any of these issues, I'd be really keen to do that. But really, I guess the key thing is, is un understanding and unpicking that multi-dimensional relationship between um, sea, coast, islands, identity, sense of place, and what that means for our maritime industries, for our ocean environments, for our governance processes, for our people, to ensure that we're managing our oceans in a sustainable way for all. But of course, there are challenges and opportunities with that. And how we think about integrating marine social sciences into um, policy is, is quite challenging. This is from some work I did for DEFRA um, a couple of years ago, looking at marine social science capacity in the UK. And I just wanted to highlight some key figures. We're kind of, we're seeing similar trends mirrored in other work, but I guess one of the key things to kind of point out, this first slide shows you the backgrounds of the people that responded to a questionnaire in the UK. So we had 159 people respond. And, and what it shows you is this, their backgrounds are kind of 
predominantly natural sciences, so biology and physical geography, like some human geographers in there. But you get a really, we've got a really interdisciplinary community already with working within the marine social sciences. And I think that's a real strength and that's something that we should build on. We identified a number of gaps um, and their thoughts around the, the kind of the challenges for marine social sciences and at the time as you can imagine Brexit was something that was very much at the forefront of UK conversations but thinking how we could feed these diverse values these marine social science inputs into the assessment of natural capital into our decision making and um, funding has always been identified as a challenge and thinking about how we can and of increase training and increasing capacity for marine social sciences, both in the research community, but also for policymakers and for, for practitioners as well. And one of the things that's come up lots of times has been a feeling that marine social sciences perhaps have been undervalued and perhaps underdeveloped in the, theoretically. And it's definitely one of the, the challenges that the Marine Social Science Network is trying to address through the work that we do. Um, I, uh, we, we, we identified a number of key themes um, that were of importance to UK researchers and I guess again it's just highlighting how complex and how mixed that, that landscape and that, that world really is. So again you see things like adaptation and climate change, fisheries and fishing communities, ocean literacy, marine citizenship, social justice, welfare, a real mix of um, priorities that came out through that group. But there was a feeling that we need a common language to understand these different disciplines. So that was one of the challenges that's always identified is that people maybe don't understand each other when they're working in an interdisciplinary way. There was a lack of understanding of marine social science methods and their application. And this actually came up in the, the meeting I was in earlier today. So perhaps a lack of awareness of the robustness and rigor that goes into marine social science research, just in the same way as it goes into marine natural and physical science research. One of the big challenges for us is that there's a lack of intuitive fit for us within governance work. A lot of our work can be case study based or qualitative and that doesn't always sit well from a policy and decision making context. And that's something that I know lots of people are trying to have conversations around. How can we better embed and integrate social sciences into the decision making processes? If anybody has a solution, please let me know. Um, and we don't we need we don't have a great baseline or kind of set of longitudinal data it's not something that's been managed um, monitored as standard we don't we haven't seen kind of the same sort of um time series data for social sciences research that we've maybe seen for managing ecological impacts of marine protected areas for example so there's a need for us to really start to build on that and I think some of the examples through the Canadian Ocean Literacy Coalition through the work that's happening in DEFRA here in the UK they're, they're starting to see that we need that baseline data so that we can work we can kind of work on understanding those communities and think about what might need to be done and what can happen next. So there's lots of things that we can do moving forward. We are having conversations about how we can demystify marine social sciences. I've kind of commented on a couple of these points already, but the need to increase capacity, highlight the impact and the value of marine social science research, really shout about our success stories and learn from what's not worked, learn from what hasn't gone, gone as well as we need to. Think about what our evidence needs are um, and how they vary with geographical and cultural contexts. What works for us here in the UK may not work in the States or in, um, in other areas of Europe. So really thinking about those geographical, social, cultural, and economic contexts. And um, we're working within the Marine Social Science Network to develop an expert directory. And I know there are some others that are kind of being developed to allow us to work together with each other, to identify each other so we can collaborate. Um, and to support a call for improved funding so that marine social science is in an add-on for um, for marine research uh, going forward. So just in my last couple of minutes, I wanted to introduce you to the Marine Social Science Network. Um, we set up in 2018, building on a um, event that was held in January 2018 with a small group of stakeholders representing a range of different organizations and researchers across the UK. Originally with a very UK focus, we were trying to understand what was the potential role for marine social sciences in the UK marine and coastal governance kind of landscape, and was there space or need for a marine social science network. Luckily, we got a resounding yes, that there was there was a demand or a desire for, for a marine social science network, but what we also found was 
and um, when we explore those those gaps and challenges and also the opportunities moving forward is a kind of mirror what I've said is that it came out of the work from DEFRA so that there was a feat there was a need for um, a network to address some of these issues so to address the identity issue that people feel felt fragmented um, and isolated from their research community that they felt undervalued um, that there was a need to improve connectivity across the research and, and practitioner community as well. Um, and we felt that there was a real chance for a network to help build that platform and move those conversations forward. And we definitely have seen a growing and developing community come out over the last three years or so. I'm not saying that those people weren't already there, but I think our collective voices are getting louder and our, our space in the marine science conversations is becoming bigger. And it's great to kind of see social science is taking um, up more of that conversation. It's a really important, important part of the marine science and research community. Um, we have a number of different goals as a network, providing a home for um, this growing community of marine social sciences, scientists and those interested in marine social sciences is one of them. And we are very inclusive, as I said at the beginning of my talk about that. We are trying to look at ways that we can promote social science as a way of supporting and delivering more effective um, policy making, supporting inter and multi and transdisciplinarity and, and kind of collaborative dialogue across the marine science community. As I said earlier, we don't want to work in silos, we want to work with people. So speaking to you today is a great opportunity for us to start those collaborative conversations, I hope. I don't do all this on my own. I have a fantastic committee with two co-chairs, Tim Aycott and Catherine Yates. Um, we have an international officer, Karen Alexander, who's based at the University of Tasmania. If you're interested in setting up a group, Karen is the person to speak to. We have a secretary who helps keep us all on the straight and narrow and a fantastic communications team that really help us deliver and develop all of the different um, outputs that you might have seen come out of the MARSOC Sci network. And part of that has been trying to develop and work together over the last few years to make sure that we're kind of always going back to our community and seeing what what we need to do, how we need to evolve as a network to ensure we're delivering something useful. So we launched in September 2018. We've run a number of workshops at various events, piggybacking at other events is totally fine. Um, in that time to, as I said, get feedback from our community and, and ask what would be useful. We've worked on coll collaborative outputs together. We had a paper out last year um, talking about the role of marine social sciences um, and it kind of its, its role in, in looking towards a sustainable future for the ocean. We have our website um, that we're using to promote case studies and blogs about various um, marine social science activities. And we're really, again, trying to showcase the breadth and depth of that research and practice that's happening across the world. Our newsletter, which hopefully some of you may have um, received this morning, and our Twitter um, group. So we've gone from that group of 35 people in that room in London on a very cold January day to being 850 people that receive the newsletter every month and over 3,000 that are engaging online. And we are talking about other platforms that we can use. So we are a growing community and a really active community. I mentioned our international officer. So she's been fantastic in facilitating the, the kind of generation of our, um, our thematic and our regional groups. So as I said, if, if anybody's interested in having a conversation about that, please do let me know. And we've been involved in conversations around the UN Ocean Decade, about around um, backing the Blue Belt, which is a UK initiative for marine protected areas around the UK overseas territories, um, and also the development of the Commonwealth Blue Charter. So really trying to have those conversations and put social science into that um, dialogue that's happening around these really key and crucial events. Some of our lessons that we've learned have been to identify our purpose. There was a real gap and I think a marine social science community was, was really needed to help bring those conversations and facilitate those conversations. And I hope we are at least helping to achieve that. Um, we know that one size doesn't fit all and that's why we've developed flexibility and, and kind of ad, ad, adaptability um, to allow for those regional thematic groups to evolve so they can address the, the needs that are in their own countries, their own regions or, or their own thematic disciplines. Um, and we also, as I said, try to be really inclusive, not just across um, the disciplines and across academia, but across sectors and career stage. So as I said, if you're a biologist, come and join us. If you're a policymaker, come and join us. We are not an exclusive group. We try and kind of be open to all. Um, and really, we're, as I said earlier, we're trying to always reflect back and, and go back to our, our community and ask them, what can we do next 
managing expectations, of course, but how can we help moving forward? So please, I, I'd love you to join us if you don't, if you aren't already linked in with Marsoc Sci. You can join up through signing up to our newsletter on the website. Um, you can follow us on Twitter and um, using lots of different hashtags. The newsletter goes out every month and always is always absolutely jam packed with a huge amount of publications and job opportunities and upcoming conferences and webinars. And we run a book club, which is in response to um, the COVID restrictions. Actually, we we felt very strongly that we were a bit concerned about the let's all publish seven nature publications in the first um, set of lockdown restrictions that happened last March. And so we set up the Mars Oxide Book Club last April and we're about to have our 13th book club chat next week. And it's definitely been one of our, our really big success stories over the last year and something that I'm personally absolutely in love with. It's fantastic, it's probably my favorite time of the month. Um, so there's loads of opportunity to get involved and we'd love you to do that. Um, so just to conclude, I feel like there's been a real momentum and a real shift in the conversation around kind of marine social sciences and its role in marine science more broadly and marine policy more broadly. Despite increased interest though, funding still remains a challenge for many of us. Um, and we're still in a position, I think, where social sciences can sometimes be a bit of an add-on. So I'd really kind of stress and kind of put out a call to, to try and work in that much more interdisciplinary way where appropriate. These, these high level conversations around ocean literacy and other topics that are quite similar are a really valuable lever. We should use these to help us capitalize on this, this momentum and this conversation. We, of course, though, have to look beyond the idea that knowledge is all we need to engage people and that all we need to change um, behaviours. It's much more, um, it's a much broader connection that emotions have a really key role in decision making. We need to recognise and, and understand diverse connections, diverse ways of knowing the relationship between society and the ocean. And hopefully marine social sciences affords us those multiple lenses. One of the points that I made earlier, and I don't think anybody's quite un, kind of unraveled it yet, is, is this need for effective pathways to impact. So we're doing some fantastic research. There's some fantastic work happening on the ground through NGOs, through charities. But we need this to be fed into decision making somewhere. And if, as I said, if, if anybody has that solution, then, then please let me know. Um, and then we need to really look at the whole picture. So how can we harness the marine social, the potential of marine social sciences? How can we need to continue working in this space to deliver meaningful and necessary change for society, ocean, coasts, and seas? And I guess that's kind of what I would leave you with this call to arms to, to really think about the, the people and, and the, the diverse values when we're, we're talking about ocean and coastal spaces. So I'm going to leave you with this quote um, that I think really sums up my journey and the importance of marine social sciences in the, the broader ocean science field. So it's from Elliot Norris who stated that my marine biology class has really helped, but in hindsight, I wish I'd taken appropriate training in psychology, sociology, economics and political science, because catalyzing change really does fundamentally require understanding more than the natural sciences, understanding more than why we can't just tell people to stop fishing, as I said in my first couple of slides, that it means understanding people. Conservation, natural resource management, managing our oceans is about managing people, it's about understanding people. Um, and for me, that, that kind of highlights the importance of marine social sciences. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you very much and hopefully we've got a bit of time for question and discussion now, so thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Emma. This was great, uh, and lots of kudos on the in the questions and and, and chat. Um, okay, so we have a few questions in, and if people have additional questions, we'll we'll try and get to, to as many as we can in the time we have. Uh, you can send them in through the chat and the uh, Q and A. Uh, we'll start off. Um, not sure if this, this question came in, not sure if things are different in the UK EU, but in my experience, there's been a burden put on social scientists to prove themselves as real science and deserving of funding, publication and time at conferences, etc. Obviously, we as social scientists know our work is important, but have you noticed a change in attitudes towards social science in academic institutions? Um, so my personal experience is yes, I have. Um, seen a change. I would completely agree that that is um, a challenge that we have faced as social science community um, and it's something that is highlighted every time we do a workshop and every time we say what are the challenges facing the marine social science community. That issue of 
reputation of identity of lack of understanding of the robustness of methods I mean I had somebody kind of question methods I was using somebody who's another social scientist but they're a quantitative social scientist and I'm more of a qualitative social scientist and I was absolutely gobsmacked that that they had asked me kind of a question about the rigor of my methodology I was like no you you shouldn't be saying that. You know that social sciences are just as rigorous, just as robust. They're just different. And so, yeah, I think that is definitely a challenge. Um, I have seen a shift, I think, in, in academia. In the UK, we've just had um, a, a recent call for across our, our some of our research councils, which was very much focusing on interdisciplinary research for marine, the UK and um, sustainable management of the UK marine resources. And it had to be an interdisciplinary project bringing natural and social sciences together. So that's a really positive sign. And there are conferences that I've been going to for 10, 15 years. And when I first started going and talked about my PhD on marine citizenship, I was asked, do you mean fish as citizens of the sea? And I was like, no, I really, really don't. Um, and now that word, those phrases, marine citizenship, ocean literacy, are being used by policymakers, by, by other academics all the time. And so I think there is a shift. It is happening. Um, it's perhaps been slower than we would like, but I would I would say have faith, have faith that it is happening. And please come and join Marine Social Science, the, the Marsoc Sign Network, so we can help buoy you up if you're ever feeling downhearted about that. We will help. Okay, and there was a question about where you could sign up for the newsletter, and I know you can do that on the the Marsoc Sci website. Um, if, if anybody has any problems, you can contact me and uh, I'll, I'll see if I can point you in the right direction. And I'm, I'm at EBM tools at, at uh, uh, octogroup.org. Okay, a question um, as a group, how can we push for more funding for marine social sciences research? Wow, well, I guess that would vary um, from country to country. Um, I think identifying champions within the um, policy world, and perhaps within the funding um, institutions is definitely one way of doing that and something we've had a bit of success with here. Um, finding people that actually kind of get it and get the importance of thinking about the people bit and thinking about social science research and embedding that. Um, we One of the, the bits of um, feedback that we've had is, is the, the need to really think about um, not just social sciences in the traditional th in traditional way of thinking, kind of not forgetting about arts and humanities research as well. So here, here in, in the UK, we're trying to make sure that, that really broad um, discussion of social sciences, of human dimensions essentially, are being talked about um, in policy, but also with the funding groups. I think the ways, the way ways in will probably be different in different countries um, but that's where we've had some some success is, is identifying those champions that kind of have your back and, and get the value of it and know and want to be engaged in that conversation and again I think the change is probably going to happen bit by bit but it's definitely a good first step. Okay thank you Emma. Um, there's a question about uh, several questions about ecosystem services. Um, we'll start. How can we formally, on a global level, place quantitative values on cultural ecosystem services? Do you think this is an area which will see increased research in the coming years? Ooh, quant I'm just reading the question to make sure I, I complete. Yes, hang on. Quantitative. Well, um, I think probably, I think there will be some more work. I think there's, there's been a real sh kind of growth in the um, recognition of the importance of thinking about cultural ecosystem services and understanding cultural connections. I think there's a tendency to go for quantitative approaches because that's what fits those policy boxes. Um, that's what fits with ecosystem services a lot of the time, natural capital assessments a lot of the time. But equally, I think there will be more qualitative research as well. And I, I would really like to see um, a, a kind of a balance in it, not just being quantitative approaches, because I think we sometimes can lose a lot of the depth of understanding of what those cultural ecosystem services, those cultural relationships might be if we can find them to numbers and tick boxes. Not that I'm saying that they aren't really valuable, of course they are, but I think it would be great to have both. Um, so I think, yes, there will be a growth in that work because it's a, a really important area and it's a way of fitting that 
evidence and data with um, those much needed kind of policy gaps and, and evidence gaps for policy rather. But I'd really like to see that balanced with more qualitative research too. And I was thinking about how we can maybe restructure our, our policy processes. And it's not just about quantitative numbers that it can be um, uh, qualitative. And I've just seen a comment come up from Marcy who said that stories can be so much more impactful than hard data. Absolutely, I completely agree. That can be where you get that connection. That can be what triggers that change. And so I think having having both is really important. Having those mixed methods approaches is, is really important. Okay, thank you, Emma. And there was a, a somewhat related question. Um, I don't know if you saw it. What potential do you see in using the ecosystem services framework to quantify more of the cultural values and that, and I guess making sure these insights are considered at the policymaker level in the near future. I mean, yeah, I, there's, there's definitely, there's potential for that because it's a framework that people are using. And, and I think there's, there are challenges and there are weaknesses to the ecosystem services framework. There are weaknesses to, you know, there's always something that we could change or, or do better. I think what's important is that we use processes that get these conversations happening and that we embed this research, this data in somehow. And so for some countries, for some places that might be the ecosystem services framework here in the UK, we've moved more to um, natural capital and that conversation is happening um, around natural capital ecosystem assessments, I think. I'm losing all, all my acronyms. Um, but I think what's crucial is that we, we get those, that data in, we get the consideration of those cultural, heritage, social aspects into these conversations and that that starts happening. So whether that's through the ecosystem services framework and that's using that concept of cultural ecosystem services as a way of quantifying and understanding the importance and the value of our ocean systems as being vital to cultural connections and, and the relationships that people have with their community, with their, their locations, with their environment, um, then I think that that's a, a good thing. Um, as I said, I think it comes down to that, that, that previous question about quantitative versus qualitative. I think we should have both. I think that would be preferable to me. Okay, Emma, thank you. And we're going to finish up with two questions of, about the network. Uh, first, are there opportunities to volunteer or help out with the network? Yes, absolutely. We would love that. And um, we will probably be putting out a call for more for new committee members um, in the next couple of months. Um, but please, I mean, if um, Sarah can obviously send out the details, but you can email on info at marsoxi.net. And um, I think the web page has gone in the chat already. Um, and yes, I saw somebody say, would I be happy for my email address to be shared? Absolutely, no problem. I would love for any of you to get in touch with me. That would be brilliant to have those conversations. But yeah, please do get in touch if you're interested in being involved in um, the network in any way. Okay, thank you. And we'll wrap up. Um, what is the network's future plan for increasing representation outside the, um, and then, and for example, outside the global north? Yeah, um, so it's something that we have been very, very conscious of. Um, we currently are talking about setting up a regional group in India. Um, and um, so we're really open to that and we are very keen. We had hoped to run events um, in obviously over the last 12 months to start kind of exploring that. And we're, tr yeah, it, it's it's something that we are very keen to do. And um, as I said, we're, we're we have a meeting um, actually in the next couple of weeks to discuss setting up a regional chapter in India. Um, I've been liaising with colleagues in various parts of Africa to talk about doing the same, linking in with the West Indian Ocean Marine Science Association. Um, so it is very much on our radar. Um, so anybody who's interested, anybody who has suggested colleagues who they think might be interested, please do let me know. We are really open to um, being engaged with that. And I guess a link to that is, is kind of, we've, we've really recognized, for example, that Twitter may not be the best way of engaging with people in different parts of the world. And that, that's why you looked at different social media pl platforms um, and what might work best in different regions. So again, any thoughts or advice or suggestion that any of you have about that would be really, really very welcome and very much appreciated. Okay, thank you, Emma. And thank you to everyone who was able to participate today. Um, Emma, is, can people reach you at that info at marsoxi.net 
uh, address? Yeah, yeah okay. so you can reach me that way or you can get my, I'll pop my work email address um, in here. Hang on okay. one second, I'll pop it in the chat for you. Yep, because I, I suspect there's lots of interest in, in uh, talking about various matters with you. There you go. So you should okay. all have my email address now. Um, and yeah, please do reach out, get in touch about chapters, about any of the research, any of the projects I mentioned. Um, really, really happy to have conversations with you all. And okay. thank you again so much for the invitation. Okay, well, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we wish you a, a bright future with uh, the Marine Social Science Network and with uh, all of your work in general. Um, thank you everyone and we'll see you in a future webinar. Okay, thank you, Emma. <laughs>